to the final conversations on social issues for spring quarter 2014. Thank you everyone for joining. I'm Kimberly, I'm one of the reference assistants here at the library. So I see some familiar faces and you have heard this before, but I also see new faces, so I want to give you a quick idea about why we do this at the library. So the Seattle Central Library believes in the open exchange of ideas and information, and though none of us are going to agree with every single thing that we have outside of this room on our shelf or in our databases, we may not agree with everything we hear in here. But I want to ask everyone to remain respectful and to have an open, honest, and hopefully engaging and informative discussion. So we bring this philosophy of open information to this series in providing this space. So all points of view are welcome, as I mentioned before. We have resources at the front. If you want to learn more about this topic, some background information, or more specific information. And of course, I, you, you can also use our speakers as resources as well. They may be here for a couple of minutes after to answer questions. So before we get started, I want to ask everyone to either take one of these, if you have to leave early to fill out our survey, tell us what you thought about this, or if you are going to be here until the end, we'll be filling out a hard copy of our survey. It's really quick. There are six uh, required questions, and they're all check or film the blank. So they're really easy to do. So today, the Seattle Central College Student Veterans Association will be leading us in a discussion about noise and its impact on veterans. So please join me in welcoming Rachel Hayes, the president of the Student Veteran Association, Matthew Perry, and Timothy Loya, who's a student veteran and advocate. So let's give them a hand. So um, I'm Rachel, or you can call me Ray. I am a Gulf War veteran. Surprise, surprise. We don't all have really short haircuts. We're not all dudes, and we're not all under the age of 30. I just turned 45, and um, that very short nine and a half month period of time is still impacting me on a daily basis and in how I deal with stressors in my life. Some of those stressors we're going to talk about today are going to be about noise and how it impacts veterans in our student body. Unexpected noises. Um, when I first got back from from Saudi back in 1991, I lived in Louisiana and I was a student then too. Um, we had these wonderful thunderstorms that were just amazing almost every afternoon in the summertime. And the smell of the, the rain hitting the, the dust and you could smell new life happening. That changed after the middle. When I first got home and my first thunderstorm was out in the shed with mom going through my stuff and trying to get reorganized and reintegrated. And I went from discussing photo albums and my winter clothes to curled up in a ball in a corner, weeping, and did not know how I got there. And it was simply from the thunderstorm outside, because I was really close to a Patriot missile base. And with Patriot missiles, you have two booms in quick succession, and then you wait for the third. If the third doesn't happen, you're in trouble because that means that a Scud missile from Iraq got through our defenses, which are these wonderful machines that are loaded on the back of a truck and are mobile units. And they're fantastic, and they really do their job well. But when you don't hear that third boom and you're expecting it, it can really change your day. Um, there, there are other sounds, like the backfiring of a car, um, door slamming, repeated noises like a jackhammer, other noises, sometimes sound like our ammunition firing. So you really need to, 
think about that old car that you've got that backfires, please go have it serviced for my sake and for yours because we don't always know what our reaction is going to be to that loud noise. Some things are really simple and easy for you. It's an everyday noise. It doesn't mean much of anything. But for us, it really can impact how we function in that classroom. Um, one veteran gave a story about a cell phone going off. And the reason is it becomes a roadside bomb. It's the trigger for an, an IED. So it's, it, it is not just a cell phone. So something that you can do that's really, really simple is turn the damn thing off, set it to vibrate or silent. There are very, very few times in my life where I actually need to take a phone call over the voice, phone, call. <laughs> so if you know that your, you know, your father-in-law is in the hospital, if you know that your child is ill at home, sure. But set it to vibrate, set it to something that is not going to affect or influence the, uh, the other students in your classroom's ability to function um, as a student themselves. We have uh, wonderful registration people here at Seattle Central. I love them to death. They do their job effectively, <coughs> efficiently, very well. However, the lines in the main hall, uh, too many people in too small a space is something we got preached to on a daily basis. <coughs> you do not gather with more than a half a dozen people anywhere you go. And that was stated over and over and over and over. And it was for our own protection so that we didn't have that many people at risk at any one time. And here, <laughs> it is not unusual to see 100 or more students in line at registration. Um, what many veterans don't know is that we have early registration available through the college, which is a fantastic program and allows us to process through without those crowds. But those crowds mean that I take a different route through the school building our Robert Warren of the school building, and I'll go up the elevator on one side, cross down the hall, and then come down on the other, and avoid that grouping altogether, rather than deal with the, the pressures of having people too close and not being able to assess the risk, which is something that we do constantly. It's called hypervigilance, and um, it looks a lot like paranoia. My father was in Vietnam when I was in the seventh grade. He stopped for 15 months, and he is hypervigilant about locks on the doors. And yes. Always knowing how to get out. Yep. Never take the same pathway <coughs> twice to get anywhere I'm going. Yep. I don't show up at the same time to any event. My class attendance means that my time of arrival is almost always before class starts but it can range from an hour and a half to on the nose walking through the door because I do not want to have a consistent pattern of behavior. And it's not something that most people would even consider in their, they go about their daily lives without thought, without being aware. So what I'm hoping that you get out of this today is that you are more aware of your own surroundings and understand that the people around you are dealing with traumatic events from their lives in all manners. And you never know what that person's path has been just by looking at them. Now, I look like a soccer mom. I don't look like I wandered around through the woods with an M16. What a idea. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my father-in-law at the time threatened to have my combat boots bronzed because they were so cute in work. <laughs> so um, one of the ways that we deal with the too many people in too small a space is a quiet place. 
We are really, really fortunate. The administration has established a veterans lounge for the student veterans. It's the only club that you don't have to become a member of. If you are a veteran, you are a member of this organization. The student veterans organization has, um, has talks like this on occasion and we also have social services that we go out and do and, and help and we make um, awareness an issue that for us. We, we talk to veterans and we do it all the time. It's something that is part of who we are. Nobody's paying us to do it. It's just something that we do. And um, those services, jobs, uh, and various items that are available to veterans are available through the Veterans Lounge. If you want to know more to help some of your cohorts or um, family members, have them come by the lounge and talk to one of us, and we can put them in touch with people who can help. We have homeless veterans here at school, um, and through the school, they are able to access more services than they would be able to on their own. Um, Seattle has a very high homeless veteran rate, and we're working with uh, organizations such as One Less Mountain and the Seattle Stand Down to help alleviate some of those pressures. Right. Yeah. We should give them the email because during the summer we're not going to be, the lounge is not going to be as open as, as it is most of the year. So if you want a way to contact anyone from the veterans group at any time, I'll, we'll give you the, the email for the group. It is checked almost daily and you can ask any question whatsoever. There's, there's absolutely no question that cannot be asked. We might not have answers to all the questions, but we'll try to find answers for you or resources or whatever we can. So I'll put it on board a little later. So awesome. Okay. Or, or you can put it if you want right now so they yeah, can read I it. Yeah, I can remember it off the top of my head. SCCC. Just put it up there. I, they won't read it. Let's try it. Let's try it. <laughs> so um, I'd like for you guys to do some input on how you can help your fellow students who are veterans to make this campus better, easier, faster. And as you think of those, um, hold on to them and we'll go back to this in just a second. And I want to talk about some other things that are not sound that are impacts. And I don't know about the other guys, but these are my three that I came up with off the top of my head. Um, because I work with the transportation unit, diesel fuel is a huge trigger for me. Um, so the buses and the sounds of the buses walking down the streets of Seattle. Consequently, I drive. I don't do the bus a lot. Um, canvas oil, we have tents that are um, heavy canvas and um, I lived on the desert for several weeks in a tent. Um, and while I was in training, I was in a tent in, out in the woods. So that smell is also a trigger. Um, I was on the port of Imam in Saudi Arabia, so the uh, smell of the Gulf is also a trigger. Going down to New Orleans with my husband for, um, Let's see, that was Mardi Gras the following year after I got back. And New Orleans went away. And I was right back in Saudi Arabia. There wasn't a, a beautiful jazz band playing in the background. I couldn't smell the beignets down at Cafe du Monde. What I smelled was the salt water and what I heard was, yeah, so when this thing happens, when you have these flashbacks, um, taking a time out is really important. Being made aware that you are here and now and not then is really important. And that can be something as simple as showing someone the calendar, a newspaper, um, even the time of day, so 
um, bringing them back to how are you today? Today is now. It's not 25 years ago. It's not 45 years ago. So, um, yeah, those are also triggers. Um, another time I stepped off the bus coming into school and it happened to be Halloween. I had not noted on my calendar that it was Halloween. And walking down the sidewalk toward me was this man in a gas mask. And the first response that anyone who has had that training is to go for your own gas mask. Well, of course I don't have a gas mask. I'm in Seattle. We don't have any need for that unless we're intentionally putting ourselves in the protest riots. <laughs> so, um, no, I didn't have a gas mask. And that set up my entire week for failure. Because now I'm faced with challenges that are real to me, but not anyone else. My stress level has gone through the roof. Um, I was, uh, it was also during the time that we had the, the Wall Street protests happening. And um, so I was, I had, the Occupy Seattle was here at Seattle Central. And there were a lot of people on campus that didn't belong there. And you knew they didn't belong there. Um, I think that even, general student body was aware that there were people coming through our, our doors that wouldn't normally be here, right? So um, that increased my stress level. So I was really fortunate that we had um, Tony Diaz, our veterans representative downstairs. He found me a quiet place under a stair behind a locked door. And I just hung out for a while. But I did miss two days of classes after that because of the level of stress that that created, just by somebody not being thoughtful about their actions and how it impacts other people. Um, okay, so suggestions, how can you help? Matt, I know you have some ideas. How can, they, how can I help or how can the student body help us? How can the student body help veterans? Well, the first thing is, to, is show up when we talk places like this and listen to what we have to say awesome. um, so so I will I'll, I'll start by saying thank you for showing up because it really is a huge difference when someone spends the, the couple minutes to learn about what affects us and like Ray says each one of us is, is different um, some of the things that bother me a lot the diesel fuel for example like you said is, is, is a huge thing that you don't even think about it. You just walk down the street and suddenly it hits you. So when you, when you learn about these things, you see me or Ray or Tim or Bob or anyone that you know is a vet, or even if you don't know that they're a vet, you just see them and something doesn't look right. They're backing up into the corner. They're withdrawing. They're, you know, just check with them. Just See how they're doing. So, you know, ask them. You know, are you okay? Is there anything we can do to help? Do, do you need me to call someone? Do you want to talk? Anything to break that sphere we're in is a big difference. Uh, Ray said, you know, show them the newspaper. Tell them that you're here at this time, this day. I still have times when I go back 20 plus years to my military service days. And I'm not even in the same country. I'm on the other side of the world. My military service was in the Middle East. I'm in a completely different environment. But it takes you back to places you've been in just a smell, a taste, a sound, in a second. And it's really hard to walk away from it by yourself. so-called ends and then you're about 
jump right back to society. Um, how do you feel about that? I, I think it's cool. Me personally, I think it's cool. I think the way I feel, I think there should be part of the world where soldiers that were in combat can go and and read or D D classify or D whatever you want to call it. Decompress. Decompress. Yeah. Or a year, two, three, whatever it takes of dealing with things that are going to happen in normal society. So you see what I'm saying? I think it's cruel to you people. I really do. It really pisses me off, to tell you the truth. They, um, they have a few things that are beginning to change. So pe for people like me, it's way too late right now. I, I'm on meds, and I have a therapist, and I have a psychiatrist, and access to group therapy. But that has to be me pushing for it rather than the military putting us in a position and giving us the care that we need. Now they do have a decompression place um, at Joint Base, and it's brand new. They're setting up psyche valves and making that available to returning veterans and integrating them more slowly. So they stay at the unit before they are sent back home to their families. There's a huge, um, a high incidence of yes. domestic violence yes. due to the families not understanding yes. where this veteran is coming from. So um, I know that <laughs> my poor husband. Um, <laughs> uh, one summer it was super hot. We were living in Alabama at the time and he was Navy, <laughs> and our air conditioner died, and it was 102 outside. So I had taken a shower and laid down under the ceiling fan, and he came in and touched me before saying anything. Mm. I came very close to breaking his jaw. So it's little beady things that you wouldn't think twice about waking up your partner in a natural and normal way, and suddenly it becomes a big issue. So the families need training as well as our returning veterans. Right, right, Absolutely. Right. And I, I, I apologize to all you veterans that served um, that you didn't have that set up for you. You know, I really do. They, I, mean, I just can't understand that. Well, I, they, they didn't know. They called it soldier, Soldier's Heart. They yeah. called it uh, no Shell Shock. shock. Mm -hmm. um, but those were the most extreme cases. You know, to look at me, you wouldn't believe that I have a 70% disability rating. So there's new ways, new ways of looking at the impact of uh, war on our veterans yes. now than what we had yes. 25 years ago. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you guys came back to the U.S., um, like did little things hurt you, or was it like like was it like slowly, or did it like immediately hit you guys? <laughs> It wasn't so much when I got back to the U.S., but trying to transition back into civilian life. A huge culture shock going from a place where everybody literally works together to everybody's out for themselves. I mean, that's, it's not that civilians are inherently selfish, it's, that it's the competitive nature of America, where the militaries are not like that at all. Yes, sir. I mean, the, the decompression idea makes a lot of sense, but I think there needs to be even more support thinking of people who go into the military right out of high school, right out of living with right. their parents, yeah. go into the military, where you're following directions your whole day, and your meal is ready, and you know where to sleep. And so when you get out, suddenly, Besides having the trauma of war, I mean, even if you haven't served in a war, you, you don't know how to manage your checkbook, plan your food. So if you're not eating well when you get home, when you're not, if you're not eating well, you're going to have trouble with stress, you know, and just planning your time, figuring out what you want to do with your life. I mean, I, I, so actually, 
to me, it if you look at the bigger picture, I'd rather we as a culture spent our money thinking about how to get along with other people so we don't have to send our young people to other places to kill other people. That would be the first thing. But then if we're spending our money, spend the money to support people when they come home. Right. Yes. Really, yes. it's a yes. very gra gradual and very detailed transition. Yes. You know? Right. Yes. There are places where um, where help is is available where where you can help, where you can put that sort of thing into place, such as the Seattle Stand Down. We'll be having that in December here at the school. It's a two day event. December, not September. Right. Correct. We, so we're eleven not, and twelve. Right. We didn't want to conflict with registration, so uh, we moved it to the very end of the fall quarter. And um, what we're doing there is medical care, urgent um, psych eval. We're setting the guys up with haircuts and gear bags and um, dental Ooh. services, food both days. Um, and this year we're doing something really special. We're doing um, resume prep. And then we're having the second day, we're having uh, businesses come in and actually doing interviews. So if you have an idea like that of how to prepare single individual meals on a budget, um, so a nutritionist would be a fantastic add to that lineup. Um, but there are places where that can happen. Let's just be proactive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, any other questions? Yes, another question. Um, do you have a sense of how many veterans are in the military? Yeah, so close. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a best kept secret in Seattle Central, I think. It is. Um, there are, there's a large number of people, our veterans, who are using veteran benefits to come to school. They're not all involved in the veterans group because of the problem that we seem to acquire in life during the service. And, and you know, you said you don't have to be in combat. It's so true. I've, I was never a combat soldier. I was a clerk. But in my service, I got involved and saw things happening to other people that affected my life that still affects me today. But the numbers themselves are not that important. The important part is that even though we may have a larger number than usual here in Seattle because we have the large, Seattle, uh, the large military community we have in the Puget Sound area, each individual member of the veterans group should be treated individually because each person is so different. It seems like we seem to have to have the same problems, but it's it's really a very individual thing. So as far as how many, I heard the numbers go from 200 to above 500. Yeah. Yeah. And it varies from, from quarter to quarter. Um, veterans don't have a very good success rate for graduation um, due to some of these issues mm -hmm. of the challenge of just getting registered for classes, the financial burden of, yeah. of classes. Yeah. And um, we have recently set up a veteran scholarship uh, through the Student Veteran Association, and we hold events to raise money for that. Um, so we can help get veterans through that, yeah, right. that, that place. Is it, um, it, I don't know, did they ever say anything about the VRAP coming back? Or? Uh, talk to me after and we'll look at getting you some information because there's new programs in the works. You had a question? Oh, do, you, do you have any comment on um, the issue involving the Veterans Administration and health care and access to <laughs> We are so fortunate here. Um, I've recently had doings with the, the Veterans Hospital here in Seattle. And um, I went from registering at the hospital to being seen by a care provider within 45 minutes. However, there are challenges. We need more people 
So if you are in the nursing program, if you're in the social work pathway and, and headed toward getting a degree in social work, if you're headed toward getting a degree in psychology, if you're um, going to become a nutritionist, consider working with the VA because staffing is an issue and um, we really need more people that are willing and able to work with veterans. In other places, 52 days to right. get an appointment. More than that, I watched it on the news. It was on the news. Yeah. Right. right. They had to, six months. Right. Serious problems in, in Arizona with fraud, and that's a whole separate issue. But in New Orleans, where they don't have the issues with fraud, they don't have an issue with staffing, <laughs> so they say. Uh -huh. 52 days to get seen by a provider is ridiculous. Gosh. No one should have to wait that long. So, um, yeah, consider the VA as a, a place to go and work. It's a, um, a great organization, especially here in Seattle. I, I really appreciate the care and concern that all of the people that I came into contact with had for our veterans. We're also putting forward a bill that will fund 50 additional community-based outreach clinics, yes. uh, increase the personnel, both in doctors and nursing for the VA, as well as offer a tuition payback incentive for people that graduate and choose to work for the VA. So you could always write your senator and say, hey, you should definitely pass this bill. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the Tea Party is being hugely opposed to that bill, so there's that. It's more money. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. What other kinds of things do you think the college could do to support them? Um, I'm leading the library if you have anything specific to the library. I do. Um, a lot of the things that would be veteran supportive are also student supportive. Um, better lighting on the back side of the building. Um, here in the library, I would like to see um, computers that don't have my back to the majority of the people in the in the room, no. um, people walking behind me is it, it distracts me from what I'm doing over and over and over and over again. So it's much more difficult for me to get a paper written um, when I don't have computer access. Um, I'm thinking it, instead of having the computers facing the wall, they might be just a little ways out from the wall, and the desk would be and turn just up. Turn mm -hmm. them around and put my back to a wall, and I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And then I can focus on what I'm doing, and I can see people approaching me. Um, I love my cohort to death, but I have a couple of my classmates who like to walk up behind me and give me a hug. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't walk up behind someone and not let them know that you're there. Anytime that you walk behind anyone, say behind you. And I, I will, and I will actually do this. And as I'm walking behind someone, say behind you, on your left, on your right. If yeah. if I know that they can't see me, let them know that you're there. It's it's really really a simple simple move to make. A small change in your behavior changes my comfort in that space to a huge degree. But yeah, the biggest one is the computers. Um, anything else that you can think of right now? Uh, the training. Training. And awareness, cla yeah, classes to raise yeah. awareness. Yeah, um, having a, a class or even two on, um, on varieties of people and also the whole lesbian, gay, transgender community, and then all of the other minorities. We have touched base on some minority interactions in some of my classes, but I'm, I'm in the behavioral science program, and we have not addressed veterans as a minority group. And that really needs to be added to our curriculum. Um, and expose people to veterans as a minority group, because we are, we're special. We have disabilities that you cannot see, and we don't react to stress situations that, the same way that other people do. So yeah, 
that would be a big help. Uh, I was surprised to hear a few years ago that in the Russian army, uh, uh, veterans who have been seriously wounded, they've lost a limb or something, are still uh, kept on in service, uh, in positions like uh, clerks, uh, and they're valued and taken care of that way. Are there people in the United States who are uh, campaigning for that kind of an approach? We have a few individuals that have been double or single amputees that are still in active service. In fact, there was a big thing with a Marine that lost both his, both his legs and then went on to airborne school. Yeah. So um, it, it does exist. Yeah, I was going to say about the same thing. The choice is not necessarily the service says that you have to leave if you have an injury. It depends on how severe your injury is and how much you want to work on, on reintegrating back into a position where you still can do a job that's worthwhile for the military and worthwhile for yourself. A lot of people who are injured say, I just want to take a break. And when they take that break, they're walking away from, from that position of it sometimes. And they don't want to come back to the, I'm going to be a soldier, I'm going to be an airman, I'm going to be a sailor. They just want to be able to get the, away from it and kind of work on, on fixing themselves a little. And by the time they do, they don't come back to the service. Right. But, we also have a few people that um, have hearing injuries yeah. because of their, uh, because of explosions, uh, that sort of thing, yeah. and they do allow them to continue in service with uh, augmentation of a hearing aid. So it happens, it's just not publicized very well, and uh, like he said, sometimes it's better to take the money and go home to your family um, and take a break from, from that lifestyle and change direction. Um, getting them into school is a huge part of that and there are several organizations that are working toward getting more veterans into especially our community colleges. Um, because the, the tuition is less expensive, we have tuition assistance for veterans, for most veterans, there are limitations. Um, so yeah, Getting them re-educated is a, a big thing. Yes, sir. When you got out of the military, mm -hmm. um, your GI bill. Mm -hmm. I did not have a GI bill. Why? Not everyone on a man to get those. Right. Wait a minute. It's not mm -hmm. a guarantee. The Montgomery GI bill. That's it's, what it used to be called when I was right. in Brazil. But, but it, I want to know, oh, so you didn't have one. Right. It's not available to everyone. And, um, it's it's a misnomer that it's, crazy. that it's 100 percent free money it's not always the case it depends on what your contract is with the military sometimes it's matching funds so you have to pay into oh yeah i did i paid into it right so then you have matching funds that come back to you for the gi bill but if you want to talk specifically about your case then you need to talk to Tony Diaz downstairs and see what all benefits are available Oh, well, to mine you. dissolved because I didn't, what's the word, uh, follow through with my whole commitment. Mm -hmm. I got an honorable discharge. I chose to get out. And, uh, there may still be some funds available and some benefits available to you, though. See me after. Even though I didn't do the two years? Even though I didn't do the recommended 20? 180, 180, 180 days? days. No, that's... So That's before 1980. After 1980, it's 24 consecutive months. No. 1985 and before. Please tell me you're right now. <laughs> <laughs> I went in Could in be. 1988, November 88, and um, if you did 180 days consecutive service, sure you have that on your D214, yes. yes, then you get half tuition here at Seattle Central. Go it's, talk to Tony. It's it's very it. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that, because we have very limited access to our veterans here on campus, we're talking about numbers. We don't know those numbers as the Student Veteran Association because that's a, we're a federally protected group. So it would be like asking how many black students do we have? How many people from Indonesia do we have? We don't know. We, we don't have access to that information. So um, we're attempting now to set up a Canvas group 
for information dissemination to the veterans, and, and at that point, we'll have files of, and information put out on campus um, so that people will know that they get half off of their tuition and that they have early registration benefits and um, access to our own computer at the Veterans Lounge, and we have the coffee going all the time. Where's that at? <laughs> Talk to me after. <laughs> All right. Uh, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, I have two. Um, the first one was uh, what age were you guys when you guys involved in that? I started at 19, and I had a couple of uh, years of college under my belt, so I entered the military as an E3. PFC. Um, yeah, as a PFC. And um, I was in the Louisiana National Guard, and the guard here and in other places has a 100% tuition exemption. Um, so I was, I was there to, to go to school, and uh, yeah, I ended up spending some time on the other side of the world. How old were you, Tim? I was 17. I'm a serial overachiever and graduated <laughs> high school early and then decided the Marines was the best overachieving route. Awesome. And awesome. then went to aviation and then I joined in 99. And so I didn't foresee anything huge happening and ended up no. seeing the world too, quite a, quite a bit of the world. I went in in 1985. It was two weeks after my birthday, my 18th birthday. And I served three years. And uh, I can remember every detail of my walking into the indoctrination and, and processing center like it was yesterday. From, mm -hmm. from the guy that gave me my first bag and said, don't lose this or else you will pay for it. And then the person who handed me that trousers, and I said, that's not much, yeah, it is in your size, and you knew better than me what size pants I wear, and everything else. You'll learn to fit in. And that was yeah, and line it Lined up for shots, and yeah. Um, yeah. I, because I'm female, I had the joy of having the oldest, most googly-eyed doctor for my <laughs> gynecological exam. Yeah. Oh my word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be an old one now. 72, 1972. 1972. How old were you when you went in? 17. 17. Wow. Yeah. So um, my sister went in at 27 years old. So um, I believe you can go in up until the age of 28 without having a special waiver. It's, but there's a waiver it's for 30 everyone. 34. It's 30 now it's 30 with a waiver. 30? Yeah, 34. 34. Okay. Wow. Good question. Yes. Well, I answered your comment. I just mm -hmm. wanted to uh, thank you guys for coming in. Mm -hmm. I'm also a Delta Storm vet. And uh, yes, I appreciate yeah. you guys coming into the school and absolutely giving knowledge to everyone about certain things that affect us every day of life. Okay, so how many vets do we have in here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven veterans here today. And three of them I had never met before, and I'm the Student Veteran Association President. So you guys have got to come by, get a cup of coffee, come hang out, see what information's on the walls. Um, and we have more Bigger Better coming up next year. I want to share, um, I did such a brief time. I went in in 88 January and got out early uh, in 89 September. Mm -hmm. Was that about 18 months or so? Somewhere around there. And see, I don't have time in service because I was under the 24 consecutive months mm -hmm. after 1980. So in turn, I don't qualify for the medical, the mm -hmm. medical from VA get medical because of that reason, which in turn, I don't qualify for a lot of other things. So in my mind, I say, well, hell, I'm not a veteran. Oh, you're a veteran. You, 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 understand, you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes I say, well, hell, right. you know what I went in? I went in 88, January of 88 until uh, September of 89 was my 
end of time and so on. We have this wonderful document for those of you who aren't familiar with military terms and technology and stuff. The DD-214 is the um, American discharge paper. And it has how many days you were in service, who you were married to at the time, where you went into service, all of your awards and certificates. Discharge. All your yeah, and, and your discharge status, whether yeah. it was honorable, less than honorable, yes. or dishonorable. Or medical. Um, or medical. Or medical. Medical is usually honorable. It shows medical. It yeah. tends to show, yeah, it, it will show that in addition yeah. to, um, it does not show your disability status. No, it doesn't. So, um, that's something that comes later and you have to actually apply for. Um, and that's a process. And sometimes that's a challenge. Just going in and filling out the paperwork. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it took me about a half a bottle of scotch to get through my paperwork. Yeah, yeah so. um, on that note, I just got my disability rating this year. I've been out for nine years. I'm glad I've that you went in. I've been this and entire time. What they give you? What percent did they give you? 50%. 50? And um, I, I waited 20 years. 20 years of not sleeping, of nightmares. Of, that uh, but that's because of the system that's set up right now. Yeah. We have to apply for it. And I wasn't willing to go through the pain of applying for it. And the phrase that I keep hearing over and over and over again is, they had it worse. The guys that got their arms mm -hmm. cut off. The oh, guys yeah. that were in combat. The guys that were um, in the trenches. Mm -hmm. I was 200 miles from the border of Iraq. Mm -hmm. I still got shrapnel in my compound. Mm -hmm. I still had terrorists come into my PX while I was in trying to find a Valentine's Day card for my husband. So, yeah, I convincing myself that I'm a veteran mm -hmm. and I am worth as much as that guy that lost his leg is a, is a, a barrier for some of our guys. Mm -hmm. So, that guy sitting next to you in class, that woman sitting next to you in class, if you hear them talking about military issues, where they've been and what they've done, send them to Tony. He's downstairs in the registration office, Tony Diaz. Or send them to us at the Student Veteran Association because we can get them started on a path to getting better education, better funding, better and health. medical health. And housing. 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 All right. We are at 10 till. Great. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.